So in class, we'll be going over uh, the steps involved in natural selection and, and explaining exactly how this uh, process works. Uh, but for to begin with, I wanted to give everyone a little bit of background on uh, where Darwin was coming from, his ex areas of expertise, and in particular, the ideas and the evidence that he encountered uh, that helped him to uh, put together uh, this theory, um, a little bit of information about what other biologists were thinking at the time, uh, so that you can better understand where, the, uh, where that theory came from. And then, of course, we'll also briefly review uh, the evidence that he had at his time and that we have discovered since uh, that helps to support his theory. Okay, so um, Charles Darwin, uh, we know is, of course, you know, the, the founder of, of Darwinian natural selection. Um, and so everyone is sort of a household name now, but what about when he was approximately your age, uh, maybe a little bit older? Um, he was a, a, in medical school at, at Cambridge University and completely miserable. Um, at the time, there were very few job opportunities for men of his social standing that were considered to be acceptable, right? And so his, his major choices were going into medicine or going into uh, the, the clergy, uh, joining the church and, and serving as a, um, uh, as a vicar. Um, uh, and he, so he's in medical school. Um, and like I said, completely miserable. He's not at all interested in his um, anatomy and physiology classes, uh, you know, cutting open cadavers and so on. Um, and so he's taking um, basically all the other courses he can think of to try to avoid taking those courses he didn't like, um, which are things like um, uh, he was taking zoology. I think he took a course on um, biological and natural il illustration. So he learned how to draw and label uh, scientific diagrams. Uh, he took a lot of courses in geology and botany. Uh, and it was actually through a contact of his uh, botany professor uh, where he learned about the job on the Beagle, uh, 1831. Um, now, interestingly, this was a job um, actually, it's more like what we would consider today a volunteer internship because he didn't, not only did he not get paid, uh, but he actually had to pay uh, to go on to this, uh, this voyage uh, because they had to cover the cost of his food and supplies and things like that. Uh, but they were looking for, uh, the, again, his botany professor knew someone else who was leading an expedition to map the coast of South America. Um, it was a cartological, uh, cartographic uh, journey, uh, and they wanted someone, they wanted a naturalist uh, to be able to uh, record the species that they observe and take samples and drawings and things like that, because of course this is the days before you had cameras, right? Um, and I believe this portrait that he sat for here, um, it was either right before or right after um, the the voyage on the Beagle, so uh, relatively a uh, young man here in this uh, in this picture. Um, so again, he joined this, he was thinking, okay, this is an awesome opportunity, right? Um, and it's not just a job, it's an adventure, right? Um, and so he, he you know, decided to go on the voyage. He brought everything he had been reading at the time. So a lot of, again, geology texts and other things um, that were full of ideas about change, geological change, um, and how you could get really big changes from very small changes over time and then you get this additive effect right so um for example you know um the the erosion action of water could eventually lead to something like the grand canyon so he's starting to think about stuff like that right uh and then again this is very different than the general uh way of thinking at the time um now of course we're like well it's intuitively obvious but you know um not necessarily so um, and so he was bringing all of that stuff with him and reading at night when he wasn't throwing up because he got terribly, terribly seasick, poor man, uh, and was really excited when they, <laughs> when they would, uh, you know, uh, basically, you know, throw over the, uh, the anchor and everybody would get off the boat and the cartographers started doing their measurements and surveys to map the coastline and he would venture inland a little bit. Um, to take some samples of the plants and draw the animals and take notes about everything that he saw on this trip. And so they mapped the coast of South America, including the Galapagos Islands, which are on the uh, western uh, 
um, off the western coast of South America. And of course, it's an island chain, so they have to go all the way around all the islands, right, in order to map them. Um, so he spent a lot of time uh, in this archipelago. Uh, and there he was, in addition to his other travels, and as I said, uh, things he had been studying in museum specimens and other things in his college, uh, college courses, he was struck by a few things. One, of course, the diversity of life on Earth, all of the different kinds of organisms that are out there. Uh, but he was also struck by how well they are suited to their environment, right? Um, he noted in particular, his, you know, the, the finches that are now named for him, right? Darwin's finches, um, how well uh, the size of the beak matched the food that they were eating, right? So birds that had large, heavy beaks were eating large, heavy seeds. And birds that had really tiny beaks were eating tiny seeds. And he even saw birds that had long, thin beaks like a hummingbird's, and they were actually drinking nectar out of flowers. Um, some were eating insects. I mean, it, he was very um, struck by how well those morphological characteristics allowed those animals to uh, succeed uh, tremendously in their environment. At the same time, he was also able to notice not only the diversity of life, but also that he could pretty easily figure out, oh, I see some birds or whatever that are similar. I'm wondering if they may be related. I'm seeing what I think are family resemblances, right? So even the finches on the Galapagos Islands that were so fabulously diverse in their beak sizes and configurations, he could pretty well say, hey, those actually look somewhat similar <laughs> to the finches I have at home uh, back in England on the other side of the world, uh, right? Um, and so he was trying to think of, okay, okay, I'm seeing all of this stuff and I'm taking all these notes and I'm really thinking about all these things and then trying to bring it together into one sort of cohesive theory to try and explain all of that. And that basically took him almost his entire life <laughs> to do that. It took him several decades to put together um, a manuscript uh, and, a, and a working theory. And so we're basically just going to hit the highlights of that working theory here. So just really quickly, here are here's a family tree um, of Darwin's finches uh, as we know them now. And this actually doesn't capture all of the finch species, but it's basically a, a subsample of them. Um, but of course, you can see how they all trace back to one common ancestor coming over from South America. Uh, we know this from uh, fossil specimens, uh, but of course, now someone has done the genetic analysis uh, and also can trace back the origin of all of these species back to uh, one, and in particular, a relatively small sample from one species uh, that was blown over by a storm, presumably, and ended up on the Galapagos Islands and found a place where, hey, guess what? There's no predators here, um, and thankfully there's food. So we're just gonna hang out here and just make a living on these islands, and the population grows, and so on and so forth. Um, and that's actually a rel relatively rare uh, to have that happen, right? Most uh, uh, groups of organisms that end up in an entirely new place, um, they either not are not, generally are they're not well suited to the environment where they end up. Um, and so they die, unfortunately. Um, otherwise we'd have a whole lot more problems with invasive species than we actually do uh, right now. Um, and of course, when you have individuals come over, you have a very small population they have some challenging issues as well, and we're going to talk about that more towards the end of, of the lecture when we talk about genetic drift. Uh, but in any event, we can see the diversity of the, of the beak sizes in particular and the corresponding diets uh, that he was observing in uh, these different species of finches while he was there. And of course, every island in the Galapagos has its own uh, set of finch species. In some islands, there's only one. Um, some islands have several, uh, depending on the size and the diversity of habitats that are present on the island. So he got a chance to see a lot of different types of, of species here. And so he coined the phrase to, to try and capture uh, these characteristics that allowed organisms to be well suited to their environment. He called them adaptations. Um, and these are characteristics that help a, uh, a population of, of organisms succeed in their environment. And by succeed, we mean uh, that they are able to survive well enough and long enough uh, 
um, to, to be able to reproduce. And in particular, um, in some, some cases, we have characteristics that actually enhance just reproduction, and they don't really affect uh, longevity, but they, um, they allow those, those individuals to uh, have more offspring, which means more chances to pass on your genes. So of course, Darwin spent a lot of time observing his finches, right? Uh, especially in terms of how their beaks seem to be so well suited to their diet, uh, whatever it might have been, seeds or flowers or insects and whatnot. Um, he was also struck by the fact that although they were clearly different, um, that they were still readily identifiable as finches. Uh, he saw them and thought, wait a minute, these look a lot like the finches that I have seen back home in England, right? How did they end up here? Uh, what's going on? Um, likewise, he uh, saw specimens in museums of emus and ostriches, right, that had been collected in Australia and Africa, respectively. And then on his tour of South America, he came across uh, the rhea, which is the bird on the left uh, hand photo here on the slide. Um, and he thought to himself, wait a second, you know, these are, um, these look a really similar to <laughs> Uh, these taxidermy specimens that he had seen in museums in England uh, from entirely different continents. And of course, you have to remember at the time, uh, we didn't really understand exactly how continental drift works. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit later on in the course. Um, and certainly not that all the land masses had been connected um, at some point in the very distant past. Um, but despite not knowing that, he, he saw this and thought, wait a second, you know, uh, uh, are these all just, you know, is this random? Um, or do, the, do, our, uh, do these birds resemble each other because they share some sort of family relationship, right? Uh, much in the way that, you know, children often resemble their parents. Um, and so that's, he was also thinking about all of this um, as he was looking at these other kinds of evidence. So I mentioned earlier that uh, when he wasn't throwing up, uh, Darwin was reading, uh, and he did. He basically brought uh, what most of us would probably bring uh, on a trip where we were thinking we would have a lot of downtime uh, to ourselves. We're probably going to bring our favorite books or uh, activities or whatever it is we like to do, uh, and he liked to read. And so he essentially brought the bestsellers of the time uh, for a scientist. <laughs> These were. Uh, publications mostly in by geologists, but also by uh, some other biologists, and in particular uh, by an economist uh, by the name of Malthus. Um, and he was reading that that book, um, and that's where he was thinking about the ideas involved with um, overpopulation of the Earth. Um, you know, his the question of why aren't we up to our you know eyes and beetles or ants. Um, was Malthus's question, basically, you know, how come we're not overrun? Um, and the point, of course, was that more offspring are born than can possibly survive. Uh, and this leads to limited resources and leads to competition. And of course, he was applying it, uh, Malthus was applying it to people, but Darwin was just thinking about it in terms of just general terms. So in addition to that resource, um, he was also reading Hutton's book on uh, gradualism. Uh, this is, Hutton proposed the idea, uh, and that's what helped uh, Darwin to start thinking about like little baby steps, little tiny changes that can accumulate over time. So Hutton's uh, idea of gradualism um, is that, uh, again, small uh, geologic forces like erosion uh, can result in very large changes if given enough time, right? So you can, uh, you can carve a, an enormous valley. Uh, with erosion over time from water or wind or some of these other other forces uh, that on the surface um, don't result in very large changes, right? It's sort of like, you know, a thousand cuts uh, and you can get to this uh, very large change again if you're given enough time. Um, Darwin was, of course, also aware of um, all the vertebrate uh, fossils that were had been presented by uh, Cuvier uh, in his uh, studies that he's published. And so he was looking at those and, and brought those with him 
uh, on his journey, and so he was aware of the, the extent uh, that was aware at the time, again, early 1800s, um, of the fossil record, and that's going to become uh, important later on. We're going to revisit uh, that in a little bit. And then lastly, on this slide anyway, um, looking at and was aware of uh, the works of Lamarck, uh, who was another biologist, who was also um, examining this problem of trying to explain how species could possibly change over time. Again, you're presented with, you know, fossils or other other evidence uh, that that organisms have changed over time, and the question was, well, how could this happen? Everyone's sort of in search of a mechanism um, by which this could happen, and Lamarck's idea um, was essentially um, the inheritance of what he called the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Uh, that's exemplified here in this picture of the giraffe uh, getting the, the, the neck that gets longer over time. And essentially his idea was, well, the giraffes are stretching their necks to reach the, you know, the leaves on the tree. Um, and as they, they stretch their necks and then the next generation um, basically inherited, inherits this pre-stretched neck. <laughs> um, and of course, now we kind of think about that and go, well, that doesn't really work, right? Um, I mean, you see somebody who's a bodybuilder, like Arnold Schwarzenegger or something like that, you know, and they work out. And uh, I'm also thinking of, you know, like the Flintstones or something. Um, he, you know, his kids weren't like born like pre-buff, you know, they weren't like Bam Bam and the Flintstones, you know, <laughs> where they're freakishly strong for a child. Um, you may be able to pass down, we know, and we understand now, you can pass down genes for, you know, particular abilities. Um, and certainly you could learn a lot of things, but that's not the same as what Lamarck is, is uh, advocating uh, here. But he was on to something, he was on the right track, um, it's just his mechanism was wrong, uh, but he was thinking about, okay, how do we you know, pass things on uh, to the next generation? And of course, we also have to remember, remind ourselves um, that none of these folks knew um, about genes uh, or chromosomes. Um, Mendel's work was, you know, decades in the future, uh, so they were not aware of, of that. It was mostly just, you know, some of these common sense uh, principles. Okay, um, and this slide and the previous slide, don't worry about the dates. I'm not going to ever test you on those, but um, only a couple of points on this slide that I wanted to point out. Uh, one is another publication by a geologist, in this case, uh, Lyle, and he came up with a, an idea similar to Hutton's, um, but a, a little bit different. Uh, it's called the principle of uniformitarianism, which is a lovely $10 word. Uh, that basically says the processes that we observe now in terms of geology, um, like erosion, uh, you know, uh, volcanic activity, um, other things like that um, that are happening now in the present were also happening in the distant past. So basically he's just saying that those types of, of processes are continuous over time. They are, um, you have that continuity over time. It's not, oh, that was then and this is now, uh, right? It's all uh, ha still happening. If it was happening in the past, it's still happening now. And again, that, uh, that helped Darwin to be thinking about uh, small changes over time, uh, and the fact that if something was changing in the past, it could still be changing in the present uh, in the present time. So that was sort of the up, practical upshot of of uniformitarianism. Uh, so Darwin comes back from his voyage, and he um, sort of starts. He sits down and starts putting together all of his thoughts, you know, from the voyage, uh, all of his observations. Uh, the, uh, the fossil record evidence that he'd been uh, looking at in museums and publications, these ideas from various geologists, uh, and puts it all together and starts thinking about it and starts formulating his theory. And he actually sits down and he, he works it all out, including the mechanism, uh, and you know, fig figures out everything as far as he can. Uh, and of course, you can see that takes him a while. And then he sort of doesn't do anything with it. He kind of sits on it uh, for a little while. And along comes uh, you know, uh, Ian Wallace, um, and he was another very well-respected uh, biologist, uh, several decades older than Darwin, 
um, has a lot of publications under his belt and was working along similar lines, again, looking at another island chain, in this case in Malaysia, uh, rather than the Galapagos, um, and had been making observations and was essentially coming to the same conclusion uh, that Darwin did. There is no evidence, there's evidence that these folks knew each other and had discussed other biological you know, um, principles or ideas, but there's absolutely no evidence that, that Darwin ever shared with Wallace his ideas or vice versa. So there's no evidence that basically Darwin stole Wallace's idea or that Wallace stole Darwin's idea. Uh, they're basically, it's a case of great minds thinking alike and they both came to the same conclusion. And then Wallace actually sent Darwin um, a copy of the paper that he had submitted to, um, I believe the uh, uh, proceedings of the, the Royal Academic um, Society of Biologists, which is still around, it's much bigger now than it was then. It was very a small group of people. It was a small world then. Um, and it had already been accepted and he was invited to present his paper to, uh, to the society. And he had sent Darwin a copy and basically asked him for feedback. Said, "Hey, I know you're think, you know, you've been working in this area, um, and you were, you know, doing some travels and and such. Uh, what do you think of this? What, you know, do you have any ideas? Am I on the right track? What do you think?" Um, and Darwin sort of was like, "Wow, okay, this is really similar to what I came up with. Um, it sounds like, you know, we're all we're both on the same page." And Darwin actually then sent Wallace. Um, a copy of what he had written. And Wallace sat down and read it and was immediately struck by the fact of how much better and well um, formulated and fully fleshed out that Darwin's ideas were. And he did something, Wallace did something that is almost unheard of. And in this case, he actually petitioned the society to withdraw his publication that had already been accepted you know, we, this, we could be talking about, you know, Wallacean natural selection uh, or Wallachian or however we, however we would, would have called it. Um, he petitioned them to withdraw it and he said, you know, um, Darwin's ideas are, are much further along than mine and he has really, really uh, fleshed out the mechanism. It's very well thought out um, and I, it's better. <laughs> and I think that you should accept his manuscript instead. Um, this is something that probably would not happen today with the fact that at least right now in academia there is so much that is tied to uh, being published and whoever publishes first gets the credit. Uh, your publication record is tied directly to promotion and tenure in academic positions. Uh, in a lot of cases uh, your publication record is also tied directly to salary and funding in terms of, of grants and so on. Um, it was not so in, in, in Darwin's time uh, nearly as much. Uh, there was a lot more freedom to sort of pursue what you wanted to, to work on and not have to worry. It was much less competitive in some ways. Uh, but for a senior biologist to basically step aside and say, hey, uh, this is better <laughs> than what I came up with uh, is really pretty amazing, uh, to be honest. Uh, and so they accepted Darwin's manuscript and the rest of this, as they say, is history. Okay, so in um, formulating his theory, uh, like any good scientist, Darwin explicitly laid out his assumptions, things that he was assuming to be true so that the reader can follow his logical argument. Uh, obviously, if you have flawed assumptions um, that you're basing your theory on, then your theory is gonna fall apart you know, upon closer examination. Um, but again, this is sort of a principle of science that you are totally upfront and transparent about you know how it is you're approaching things and what you're assuming to be true uh, and that way anyone could reconstruct your argument so one of the things he assumed to be true of course is that offspring resemble their parents um, we know that Mendel's work was decades in the future he had no idea about genes but he did understand uh, that characteristics um, are shared among groups of organisms because they have a shared ancestry they have a shared family relationship right so he saw this with the with the finches that looked very much like the finches uh, on on the um the british isles where he's from uh and of course in the giant flightless birds uh 
that he noticed uh, in South America and which looked very similar to the specimens he had seen um, for, that were from Africa and Australia. And of course, now we understand uh, that yes, they are in fact part of the same family uh, and they do share a common ancestor that was alive on the continent of Africa before the continents split apart. And that's why their descendants are no longer in the same uh, location. So he was right, <laughs> uh, but was explicitly stated, hey, I'm assuming that this is true. Um, he also explicitly assumed uh, that Malthus was right, uh, that you have far more offspring born than can possibly survive, and therefore the resources to support them are going to be limited. And this is going to lead to competition uh, for those limited resources, whatever they may be. Uh, he assumed that that was true. So based on these two assumptions and the observations that he made on his travels and what he had been reading and so on, uh, he essentially came to the conclusion uh, that it is an unequal ability to survive and reproduce in individuals. So some are better at surviving and reproducing than others uh, within a particular uh, species. Um, and these individuals that are better able to survive and reproduce then essentially pass on those characteristics that are allowing them to do well in a particular environment to their offspring. They survive better, they leave more offspring, and of course this means that those characteristics that allow them to survive and reproduce better, which of course he had called adaptations, those adaptations then become more common in the descendants and over time this of course leads to uh, changes in species over time as they are essentially molded um, to be better suited to their environment and this then leads to the diversity of life that we see on the planet. So Darwin of course presented some evidence in the formulation of his theory but since then uh, we have also uh, discovered several different lines of evidence that appear to support his, uh, his idea uh, that these uh, uh, traits or adaptations accumulate over time. Um, and of course that uh, organisms uh, that are similar uh, are, are more likely to, to have a shared ancestry in common. In fact, we actually have a, a term for characteristics which are similar between species uh, and they're similar because of a shared ancestry. And these are what we refer to as homologous uh, characteristics. We're gonna talk about this a lot <laughs> later on in the course, uh, but just as an example, uh, we can see the, the bones in different mammal species. Again, because we all share a common ancestor, um, we all have the same uh, bones themselves, but you notice that the bones are shaped differently. Uh, some bones may be lost uh, over time and their, their shape and their size varies uh, depending on how the, the limbs uh, have been used. Uh, but unmistakably, uh, we can see the same bones present in these different species, right? So we have our humerus, right? It's our upper arm bone in humans. Uh, we have a radius and ulna in our forearm, uh, multiple uh, carpals in our, in our wrist. Uh, metacarpals that are in the you know, palm of our hand, and then of course you have the, uh, the phalanges uh, as part of our digits in our fingers. Cats are actually walking on their toes. They're, uh, they're walking on uh, their version of the fingers, right? Um, and so what sort of looks like their ankle is actually, you know, the, their wrist bone um, and, uh, you know, their elbow uh, is, is higher up. And again, the, the length and uh, proportions of the bones have changed, uh, but the bones themselves are still there. I think the biggest difference uh, change here is in the whale, right? Uh, here we actually have uh, the loss of, um, of some phalanges, and some of them though are much, much longer <laughs> uh, than, than they are in, in other mammals, and then you have this fusion of a bunch of the other bones so that they are uh, much shorter and fatter. Uh, over time. And of course, this is an adaptation to living in an aquatic environment. 
Another idea that supports um, Darwin's theory is uh, the idea that, and this is again something he knew nothing about, uh, but that we now understand as we can now watch embryos develop under a microscope or take samples at different stages. And what we see is that the pattern of development that an embryo goes through, um, essentially, um, you, you see the same patterns in related species and they may just add on additional stages. So, uh, for example, comparing a, um, a chicken uh, embryo um, to a human, uh, you see them both go through stages uh, where they have very fish-like characteristics as a reflection of, you know, of some past uh, relationship. Uh, they still go through these developmental stages. Now, of course, uh, the pharyngeal pouches that this uh, slide is pointing to, those are essentially gills. Um, now, of course, in normal embryonic development in people, our gills close back up, right? We don't need them because we breathe using lungs. So does the chicken. Uh, but they still actually go through a stage where they develop gills and then they lose them uh, later on. Uh, you know, particular here, this particular uh, point in development, the human embryo has a very clear uh, tail, a post-anal tail, which is a vertebrate characteristic. All vertebrates have, have that. Um, it's actually a coordinate characteristic, but uh, it's been retained in the vertebrates. Uh, and of course, we mostly lose our tail later on. Uh, there actually are cases of folks who have been born with their tail still intact. Uh, most people choose to have it surgically removed because otherwise you're cutting holes in your pants and it's just kind of awkward. Uh, we don't really use our tail. Uh, of course, other, other vertebrates do, um, but the fact that we all have those things that we go through um, similar um, uh, development stages, which is basically what ontogeny means. Um, so basically, de on development, um, we sort of re we sort of see um, our our phylogenetic history <laughs> reflected uh, in our developmental stages. Is essentially what this is saying. A similar idea that also. Um, supports uh, Darwin's, Darwin's ideas and Darwin's theory um, is the existence of vestigial structures. So these are characteristics, uh, essentially remains of previous adaptations uh, that are no longer serving a purpose uh, there, but they're still being carried forward um, as essentially a um, baggage, <laughs> evolutionary baggage. Uh, we still have it, even though it's no longer serving a purpose, uh, because it did serve a purpose and an important one in the distant past. Um, so to continue on with the tail motif, uh, we see this uh, when we look at other primates, our uh, primate relatives, uh, the capuchin on the left, uh, for example, as a monkey that has not only just a tail, but the tail is prehensile, meaning that it can grab uh, objects with its tail. Most notably are usually branches or the things so he can hang. Uh, hands free <laughs> uh, and use his hands to forage for food or something else uh, and not have to hold on to uh, the branch of the tree or whatever it is uh, to keep from falling. Uh, again, we are generally as humans not, not born with a tail. All we have left is our tailbone and this is something our coccyx. This is something that most of us are completely blissfully unaware of at most uh, most of the time and we don't really care about except when we fall and we bruise it. And if anyone's bruised their tailbone, boy, you are, you are definitely reminded that there is a bone there. <laughs> it exists. Uh, that, is, that is an extremely painful thing uh, to have happen uh, to you. And you're, you're definitely uh, aware of the fact that uh, that bone exists. But um, in, in general, that's all that's left of our tail and we just didn't need it anymore. Um, our appendix is another uh, characteristic that, that served a function uh, in the past. Uh, it, it was something we would have, uh, you would swallow basically like rocks and things, uh, go into your, into your appendix and your appendix would uh, basically was used to grind up um, nuts. Of course, now we use tools to take the hard shells off of, off of the nuts, and in the past we had to use our teeth and or swallow them partially whole. Um, and so your appendix, essentially, you could grind up or 
uh, and, and break down uh, those somewhat undigestible pieces. And that way they could pass safely through your digestive tract without uh, necessarily you know, uh, puncturing you or causing too many problems. Uh, again, it's something that we don't use anymore. Uh, we don't need it. And it has gradually gotten smaller and smaller. And right now it's basically just something that's annoying uh, because sometimes it gets infected. Another idea that supports um, Darwin's theory, and we can actually watch selection happen, uh, is artificial selection. Um, so in this case, it's not the environment that's choosing uh, which characteristics allow an organism to be successful in surviving and reproducing, but rather people who are selectively breeding organisms for particular characteristics. Uh, interestingly, in both of these examples, um, the the um, organisms in 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 point uh, are still the same species, uh, but we have just bred particular lineages for specific traits, right? Um, so we're seeing you know the Great Dane and the Chihuahua are both you know uh, Canis familiaris. They're they're both the same species, which is a different species from wolves. So we did have a speciation event there, um, but. Uh, the Chihuahua and the Great Dane can still breed and have fully viable offspring that, that do just fine. Um, I would suggest having it be a male Chihuahua and a female Great Dane, otherwise things just don't go. <laughs> um, or, hey, man, those puppies are going to be way too big for, for mama, so there are certain crosses that maybe are not so successful. Uh, but we've bred certain, again, breeds of dogs for particular characteristics, just like we've bred selectively uh, wild cabbage uh, for, which is the, the, the plant at the bottom. Um, this is something that you see growing by the side of the road all the time in the, in the spring and early summer here in the valley. Um, and we've taken those plants and selectively bred them for particular features like large leaves and cabbage or um, uh, flowers that don't, you know, that don't open as early in broccoli. That's actually what you're eating is, the, is part of the flower. Um, you know, buds that don't, you know, don't open in the case of, of Brussels sprouts and so on. Uh, so we can actually select features and see that the incidence of those features increases as we as we selectively uh, as we choose who gets to breed uh, and if they have the features that we want and uh, we breed them then we see an increase in the incidence of those of those features and of course we also have our fossil record um, now our fossil record now is much more complete um, than what was available in Darwin's time. Uh, but there was still a pretty decent uh, record of, of fossils uh, that he was aware of. Um, and we can see uh, essentially lineages that change over the course of time. Some disappear uh, completely and other new species seem to, in some cases, appear out of nowhere. Or you can actually watch uh, what looks like speciation events uh, occurring within uh, the fossil record. Uh, now, it's always going to be complete, excuse me, it's always going to, go, going to be incomplete. We're missing um, some, piece, some pieces of the record. And part of that is um, the fact that uh, fossils may be destroyed uh, by geologic events. So uh, fossils that once existed were destroyed in earthquakes or um, uh, volcanic activity or rock falls or any of those kinds of things. Um, they may be buried someplace that's completely inaccessible and we're never going to find them basically um, and it's also uh, incomplete because the record of course is going to be biased towards not only um, environments that favor fossilization so uh, in particular uh, sedimentary types of habitats where you can have layers of silt or sand or mud uh, deposited on top um, of remains and essentially encapsulate them and, and preserve them very well. Um, some environments are really not conducive to fossil formation, um, but uh, it's also going to be biased towards species that have harder body parts, right? So uh, things that are soft and squishy, like a jellyfish, uh, just don't tend to fossilize as well as something that has a hard, 
uh, skeleton um, like the you know the fish with the bones or the trilobite here on the top left uh, with a uh, an exoskeleton um, that's made of, of chitin uh, or likewise any sort of shellfish that have a you know calcium carbonate uh, shell that's going to be very very nicely uh, preserved in a lot of a lot of cases so we have some bias in the record in terms of the uh, types of organisms that tend to be preserved. Now, that's not to say that you, you don't. We have no fossils of soft-bodied animals, or even in some cases, we have fossil fossil footprints. <laughs> uh, we have fossils of um, jellyfish. We do have fossils of worms and other things that um, do not have any hard body parts, but they're just not nearly as common uh, as as those hard body uh, fossils. And of course, it's not just uh, rocks that can contain fossils, right? You can have uh, frozen in ice. We have um, uh, giant um, woolly mammoths preserved perfectly uh, in ice along with some other types of organisms or even in fossilized tree sap a la um, uh, Jurassic Park here with the mosquito uh, that's preserved in amber. And of course, as we've discovered more and more fossils over time, uh, not only are we able to observe uh, gradual changes uh, in different lineages of, of species over time as they split, uh, in some cases go extinct, um, it helps us to understand uh, which organisms are, are more closely related uh, to each other. Um, as we date those fossils and we can determine now, of course, with reasonable accuracy how old a fossil is by using different uh, radioactive isotopes and other dating methods. Um, we're getting more information about how organisms are related to each other. And in some cases, we actually get really lucky and we find uh, fossils that help us fill in the gaps. So one criticism of the fossil record has always been, uh, where are the transitional stages, right, between uh, major uh, speciation events, right? So for example, uh, we have multiple lineages of mammals and um, a lineage is basically just the descendants from a common ancestor. And again, we'll go into this more later on in the course when we talk about biological classification. Uh, but uh, mammals, uh, ancestors of mammals uh, have returned, they, you know, their, their ancestors you know, came from the water uh, to the land spread out all over the place. We had lots of different species form. And then some groups returned to an aquatic uh, existence, either in fresh water, but most predominantly in salt water. Um, and the, cr the criticism has always been, well, where are our tr transitional forms? Basically, in the case of, of mammals, uh, you know, where are our uh, mammals that are uh, swimming with their tail but still have their legs, right? You'll notice whales and dolphins, for example, have no external hind limbs. They are propelling themselves forward with their tail only uh, and in a manner that's totally different from, from fish, uh, which of course helps us to establish that they are mammals and not fish. Um, but the question of course has been, well, how did you go from having four limbs to this current configuration of of front limbs with no external digits either, right? We have to look at the bones underneath to see if the remains of the fingers um, and no external um, hind limbs either. Um, uh, some whale skeletons don't have any at all. Uh, some have essentially vestigial uh, hind limbs that are just kind of hang there and they're not really connected to anything because they don't really do anything. And recently, and by recently, I mean within the last you know, five or six years, uh, we've had some really exciting fossil discoveries in uh, Israel and China and a few other places in that part of the world, um, essentially you know, you know, Asia, um, that ha have, we have discovered transitional stages uh, of multiple uh, whale species, basically that we're filling in the gaps in that transition from land back to water and aquatic existence. Um, and we filled in a lot of those gaps uh, very, very recently, um, including finding stages that are over 50 million years old. Um, so we know um, um, in particular whales and dolphins returned uh, to the water approximately 98 million years ago. So um, 
a big gap <laughs> uh, to have to try and fill in. Uh, but we found uh, uh, transitional forms that do still have all four hind limbs in addition to having an elongated uh, tail. Uh, these fossils we know from uh, different types of isotope analysis. Uh, we're spending time in both freshwater and saltwater. They were going back and forth. So this tells us a little bit about how uh, they made a living. Uh, we're also able to establish from the fossils who their closest uh, living relative is, and it's hippos. <laughs> um, so it was the ancestor of hippos that went back to uh, the water, and of course that's where we got um, the now descendants of, of, whale, of um, our whales and dolphins now. Um, it's another thing we also can, can find in the fossil record, again, if we're lucky and when we're uh, uh, careful in our excavation and preservation of, of specimens and we know where to look, um, is evidence of whole new species, whole new uh, types of organisms uh, that have evolved. So here we are in the bottom, here we have a, uh, a photo of the famous uh, Archaeopteryx uh, fossil. This is um, widely accepted to be the first bird. Uh, we have since uh, discovered uh, at least two uh, more fossil species that may be earlier transitional forms. Um, there's still some argument, arguing going on between the expert, experts as to whether um, those new fossils are um, still uh, more dinosaur-like and more lizard-like and they're not bird-like enough to consider them to be birds. Uh, yes, birds are dinosaurs, spoiler alert. Uh, so <laughs> we're gonna get into that more uh, later on in the course. Uh, but in Archaeopteryx, you can see, uh, of course, very bird-like characteristics, and most notably the feathers uh, that we see that cover um, all, of, all of its body, although we do have dinosaurs that had feathers and did not fly. Archaeopteryx has wings, of course, also, but wings that have claws on the end of them, and most birds don't have claws uh, anymore. Uh, on there, some of them do, but most of them uh, have lost that feature. Archaeopteryx, it's not possible to see in this photograph, uh, but has still has teeth uh, in its mouth. And of course, birds have lost their teeth because they're, they're, it's too heavy uh, to carry that around and try and fly. So you're seeing a lot of very um, reptile-like uh, characteristics in our widely accepted first bird um, uh, fossil uh, species. So here's our, hey, we've just had a speciation event. We have a whole new lineage of organisms uh, that have then additionally branched uh, further and further uh, as we've gone along. And again, we're, we're going to get into this a little bit more uh, later on in the course when we talk about uh, phylogenetic classification and how we define species and uh, who's more closely related uh, to whom as we sort of march through uh, the biodiversity on the planet.